Hello and welcome. This is BAME OT episode 11. My name is Amber Ocampo and I'm a student at Huntington University located in Phoenix, Arizona um, in the United States. And this podcast, I wanted to talk about research and education in occupational therapy. Um, with that, I will be asking some questions um, with Mish, who I actually found on Twitter. So it'll be, it's kind of nice to be connected to OT in different parts of the world other than my own little world. And originally I wanted to do this session because of a class I am taking, but uh, it just became so much more. And I feel like I've found <laughs> so many different people in this field. So it really brought some different perspective to what occupational therapy is to me. Um, so I guess the first question I wanted to ask, and I feel like you've been asked this a million times as an OT, uh, why did you choose occupational therapy and what does this mean to you? Well, thank you very much, Amber, and welcome to BAME OT UK. Um, yes, yeah, so that question. Well, it started off in that I was looking for a career after I finished my degree in medical physics. And, you know, I was young, I didn't know what to do, floating around. So I started vol voluntary work um, as a support worker at a day center for adults with profound learning disabilities and severe physical disabilities. Um, and there I discovered occupational therapy and I was hooked. And the job played so much to my skills. Um, and it, it really, I, I kind of flourished. I, I blossomed and uh, I wanted to do some more, but was hitting a, a kind of boundary because I was not qualified. Um, and it was my um, manager, I mean, she was an occupational therapist, so I got to learn from her a bit more about what was occupational therapy. So yeah, that, that's how I got into occupational therapy. And I guess I, I can tell you what, what it means to me in that um, from an occupational therapy educator perspective, I think I felt that occupational therapy was about emancipation. It was about emancipation from the, the shackles or the limitations that are in a way imposed on people by their physical or mental health conditions or circumstances by structures and institutions and, and societies. And, and occupational therapy was um, about tapping into those actualizing human potentials uh, and giving the person a view of their potential as well that was different, a different narrative to what the structures and society was telling them. And it is a equalizing therapy, I think. Um, it's enabling people to live and not exist. It's enabling people to do what they want and need to do um, to thrive and to contribute to their community as a active individual. Yes, that's my answer to that question. Wow, that was a very full and complete question. <laughs> I think, I don't think anyone has answered um, in the same way that you have. It's always been kind of like it allows people to live the highest quality of life, whatever that means to the individual, just kind of basic level stuff. But I really love that answer. Um, was there like a mentor or um, I guess a guide that influenced you to do OT? Um, and if so, do you think that having a mentor in this field is important? Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I had a mentor I, uh, to get me into the field. I, I think the head occupational therapist at that day centre where I was volunteering, remember, Julia Hancock, she, she was encouraging me and inspiring me. So I wouldn't say she was a traditional 
mentor. She gave me the information, she gave me the knowledge to then um, apply to go to occupational therapy school. I think a mentor is a personal choice, an individual preference. And I think it helps, if you want to, it's there to help you build your confidence and explore opportunities. And it was there to support and guide and help you develop knowledge and understanding. But I don't think you need to have a mentor. I think if you feel there's a need for support, there are many ways to get support. You have peer support, you have the social media support, you might have family support, you might have someone in the profession um, in health or social care, but not directly in occupational therapy that might support you but not a full rounded mentor I mean I'm a non-clinical mentor for a few qualified occupational therapists and it was their personal choice to seek me out and to ask me to be their mentor and they were very clear what they wanted from me they wanted this extra support that was not about their clinical practice but it was about their career progression and finding opportunities for career development yeah yeah I guess I don't have a mentor in this field yet but I did have um, a couple people that really influenced me to apply to OT school Um, I just feel like you know, being a person of color in seeking occupational therapy and looking at the field, the numbers are a bit daunting. Um, I don't know what it is in the UK, but in the US, I I learned that 87% of practicing occupational therapists are white. And (laughs) the rest were just like in the shared minority. And it became even less so when you looked at the Asian community, the Hispanic Latino community, and the least, least of the very bottom of those stats were the black community. So I thought it was like, maybe not for me. I just wanted somewhere where I could belong, but um, it was really helpful to have a professor or a teacher tell me, no, I think you do belong in this field. And it's just reassuring to have that. But I guess I don't really have a mentor in this field. I don't know much about it yet. (laughs) I'm still a first year student, so still kind of learning the the reins of everything. I think, you know, you make a good point there. I think uh, for for the network that I'm in, BAMO to UK, uh, our members do offer, um, if, if people come and seek us out, we will you know, support them and be their mentor. Uh, similar numbers in UK as um, in America. And that's why we did that first podcast of black female occupational therapists. And then the second one, which is the rarer being, which is the black male occupational therapist. Uh, and we, we did that on purpose. We wanted to make sure that the, uh, our black uh, communities knew that this was a a profession for them and we also did one on the Bangladeshi community to promote occupational therapy because that uh, that uh, population is even rarer in occupational therapy so we promoted uh, through that podcast uh, the profession for that community but yes belonging is such an important factor in your career choice, in whether you sustain yourself in your career, which is important because, you know, we do see uh, people leave quite quickly if they don't get a sense of belonging. So that's really important. And you have to, from now, I say, you have to go and seek your community, seek your peers that are going to help you to feel that belonging and seek those allies as well that are going to support you in your belonging and your career as well. Yeah, that was, that was really nice to hear. Um, I just remember thinking halfway through my semester here, I was um, kind of worried about my mental health and just 
feeling like there was no one can no one could really understand like being a person of color and um, being a first generation college student in the U.S. So it was just a lot of factors that I felt like I couldn't relate with my cohort until I found I ended up making an occupational therapy Twitter and I found a lot of students that were in my situation and I found BAME OT UK and I kind of wish that the US had one. I feel like it would have been a nice community to have like on tap, you know. There are a lot of roles in occupational therapy from leader to advocates to actual practitioner and researcher. I know that you are currently a PhD student, so why did you choose to go towards the research route? Yes, so, um, well, yeah, you're right. I'm primarily an occupational therapy educator, and I am a PhD student, and my research topic is People Enabled Service Improvement in Occupational Therapy. And the reason I decided to go into that research route is because it felt like the next step in my academic career and really passionate that we need to grow our research publications in occupational therapy. And we need to see this at every level from students, from academics, from practitioners. And I very much want to see citizen research in occupational therapy in publications. Um, Definitely, if, we, if you're about people, then we should be seeing people researching us and our interventions and publishing it. Why not? Yeah, I think it's really important to have more OT research out there. Um, I don't know. My professor has always made a joke that when we're going through database searches, um, when you type in occupational therapy with said disorder, disease, disable, whatever you're trying to look for, she calls it a kill search uh, because of how relatively new the field is in research and that it can be really difficult to find articles in mainstream search engines. So how does this affect formulating a research question or finding a research topic for you? Do you find it to be easier because there's so many topics that haven't been discussed yet? Or do you find it difficult because of the, not difficult, but do you find it to be more pressure since you might have the responsibility of setting the foundation for future research? You know, you, you can't let it hold you back because there is little research. I see that as an opportunity to encourage creation um, of more research and research publications, uh, opportunities for collaborations. So, um, you know, it, there isn't much of us in a certain field and there's certain people um, doing the research or publishing the research in that particular field, why not try and join with them and create an opportunity um, and, and kind of break through that, that way into publishing research and, and um, you know, carrying out research. And, and I think there is a thirst for, like I said, citizen collaboration research, where we partner up with citizens to lead the research, um, formulate the topic, the question, design the delivery and evaluation. I mean, I, I am a glass half full kind of girl, you know hey, good research is painful. You can't get away from it. You know, learning is painful. Um, and it's painful until we understand and then we start to get a bit more clarity about where we're going to go, how we're going to do it. But you have to seek out effective and useful ways of trying to understand what is the question to be asked here? You know, what is going to be impactful and meaningful for, in the end, it's about citizens not serving the therapist more. It's about the populations we serve and not just an academic, you know, academic exercise, if you like. Yeah, and, and always seek to speak with those that are frequently research active because 
that's where you can start to, you know, um, crack open those opportunities that might help you find and overcome, I I would say, that kill search feeling. (laughs) I mean, there are resources out there to help us with our research journey. And it might be that it is about joining up with other disciplines or other research active people and putting that occupational therapy, occupational science lens to that particular topic. I really do appreciate um, people like you in the field seeking to expand like what occupational therapy is and how it can be scientifically applied to different populations. I feel like that's where the United States is lacking in the field. I feel like we're so focused in the practitioner role, um, which is why there's such a big emphasis in a clinical doctorate that is pretty much the same exact same thing as a, a clinical doctorate in physical therapy, you get a clinical doctor in occupational therapy. There is very, very few PhD programs for occupational therapy in the United States. And it really worried me when we were learning about the field and the history of the field. Um, in the earlier days or toward like not too long ago, about 20 years ago, it seemed like there was a lot of hunger to expand occupational therapies roles in society but now it's been starting to feel like we're stuck into rehab rehab or early intervention at least this is what it feels like in the U.S. so I guess my question is what does occupational therapy look like in the U.K. is there I guess a better foundation for research out there um Are there a lot more topics available for you to research? Um, Is it something that's more emphasized or is it kind of stuck in the whole clinical setting of therapy and rehab and early intervention? Yes, and yes, and yes, similar, similar, similar. And do you know what? I, I think when you're, I know we've been around 100 and so years now, but when you're still a a, um, fledgling profession, uh, you know, I guess, in comparison to other professions you you try and stake your claim your competitiveness your um, alignment with what's happening and then and it is to do with that uh, medical side of things you know you want to show that you are uh, as good as in some way to that profession and I think back in the 90s, actually, I felt that occupational therapy was really getting too too much into the science speak and not about the social science things, uh, side of who we are. And I I think we were losing that. I mean, in the UK, we are a welfare society, yet when you look at occupational therapy, it is much more based in the hospitals, in the NHS. But the, the thing is that there's there's more occupational therapy in the NHS, less so in the community and doing that welfare side of things. There are occupational therapists in, in social care and uh, much more in the prison service now. But I think there's a, in the UK anyway, if I can talk about it from that respect, there's a, a missed opportunity in actually growing much more occupational therapy in the community, in, 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 in social care, in community practice, working more with the justice system, with the police system. We have got some occupational therapists working um, directly with the ambulance service as well, but that's more about um, admissions avoidance, you know. That's why the topics that are here in the UK align itself to the idea of acute services or services in the hospital. So you're looking at things like, um, you know, physical and mental health in acute services, um, your or forensic services. You're looking at things around the emergency department, occupational therapists, general medicine, elderly care pediatrics and and the research topics seem to align with those um with those uh places as well so you've got your stroke service dementia care cardiac pulmonary rehab eating disorders uh, mother and baby units you know these are the research topics coming up because that's where 
occupational therapy is and also maybe if I can say that's where it's much more sexier if you like you know it's like oh stroke services that's great and, and the public know that and and the medical profession know that so yeah I'll do you know a research around that because people will understand the topic and then probably understand that yeah occupational therapy um, does have a lot of good in there and there are lots of publications in stroke and dementia care in those kind of places and what I'd like to see is more around prison services more around homelessness there are specialist occupational therapists in prison services and in homelessness and uh, I'd like to see more about doing occupational therapy so that it's preventing people going into hospital if they don't have a particular acute exacerbation or in a new condition like how can we really work with the GP services to enable this kind of community occupational therapy you know that's helping um the, the the local communities to help themselves so they don't need us Abolition, no, abolitionist occupational therapies that's what it is <laughs> I couldn't get it out that's what we need to think about where people and communities don't need us and then we move on to the next um, uh, group you know to do so that they just sustain themselves and are able to get on with their everyday living. Yeah, I think it's really funny that you mentioned that because in re if you were to look at occupational therapy research, at least in the databases that I've looked at, a lot of it is just basically saying, look at, look at this field, like occupational therapy is effective. This is us taking care of acute care settings, us taking care of late end settings or early intervention settings. But there's not enough research talking about what can we do to help people before they have to go into therapy? Or what about the populations that are impacted by their environment, like the homeless population, the prison population, or lower income? It just, that is something that kind of bothers me in OT. It does seem to have a favorite audience <laughs> with who they serve. And I definitely see that in the U.S. with the um, OTs I've shadowed. A lot of the demographics they're helping are higher socioeconomic status, white families whose kids have autism or same demographic, but with their older family members. It seems like we like to pick and choose which people that we will help because of money. Well, at least this is how it is in the US. <laughs> Might be different everywhere else. Um, but I guess that answered my question of where do you hope to see occupational therapy research in the next 20 years, given that we've kind of ignored the, I guess, the human rights aspect, the sociology aspect of it. Yes, yes. You've got the measure of me, you really have. Um, yeah, looking forward, I'm not saying let's forget about what's happening in hospitals and what's currently happening, but we need to expand. And yes, and you know, the, the US system is based on that money side of things, but here also, even though it's a, a national um, health service and it, it, the social care is funded through our um, uh, council taxes it's still about where's the research you know who's paying for the research what's coming out of there How, and, and and the thing about in the UK occupational therapy is everywhere but it's not heard about or seen until something happens and then you link up with an occupational therapist. And we need to brand ourselves much better in the UK, especially those working in the community. The NHS has a beautiful logo, a big blue logo, you know. And uh, I think in, in community and social care, I think occupational therapists need to have a bigger branding. So research, I think going forward, say next 20 years, I think the footprint, like I keep saying, I want citizen collaborative research. I want to see more student research out there. Um, 
as well because they're, 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 they're the starting off in their career, but also they've come in to the profession. They've got new eyes, new heads, and they're going to see things that may be, you know, uh, older people in research uh, and have been doing it well may not see. But I do want to see more, like you said about this, around social justice. I want to see more mental health um, and homelessness research. I want to see more public health occupational therapy research, of course, because I'm in the game. I want to see more decolonizing the curriculum research. I want to see research around climate change and sustainability and how occupational therapy works with communities to help that happen as well. And definitely, like I said, I, I, there is such an increase of homelessness. I think we really need to see what is happening there from an occupational science lens and bringing up solutions, working with the homeless community to help us um, identify what is the questions that need answering, you know, and, and how they feel we need to uh, actually answer them what do we need to do to work with them to design our research that is going to be impactful for them in the end I feel that is missing so much yeah uh you kind of answered my question of like how practitioners and researchers in occupational therapy can work together and you're right about having the occupational science lens kind of clarify what the problem is in specific populations and having solutions kind of, I guess, what's the word for it? Just coming up with solutions. And I feel like that's where practitioners and researchers in OT can really collaborate so they can figure out exactly how to fix what is going on in the little gaps <laughs> in OT. Yeah, I think you're right. I we don't, there is a kind of separation and sometimes I think elitism between researchers and practitioners, both thinking the, the other is worse or better, you know, <laughs> however they want to think about it. And, and act, actually there, there are pockets where there's great collaboration, but again, in those easier visible topics, instead of the harder hidden topics that that need accessing that need visibility that need research um the research spotlight on it to get more attention from the wider health and social care community as well so yeah uh we need to stop gatekeeping and we need to think collegiate collaborative interactions uh i i definitely feel there's a lot of gatekeeping to protect the 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 same kind of knowledge generation and I think we need to diversify yeah I definitely agree I feel like OT could be a very powerful field if there were more collaboration between the people in direct care and the people who are doing research um it would change a lot. <laughs> um, so I guess it doesn't really, it's not really relevant to my next question, but um, what is the hardest part about research in OT? What is it, does the um, discrepancy between practitioners and researchers kind of make it difficult um, or does it make it easier to just kind of pick and choose what you want to research? I'm not sure if that question made sense. <laughs> I, no, it does. It does. Do you know what? I don't think it's ever easy to do research. And I don't think it's... It, let me give you my case example. The pandemic happened when I was going to have to collect data and it kind of scuppered my whole data. So, so I'm like a year behind in my research. But... Prior to that, trying to find a site where practitioners felt they could trust me to come in and work with them, it was just the grind of the day job making them say, you know, I don't think we can do this is a lot of work. I don't think we can join with you. And it's about different 
aspects of this idea of researching it's like multifactorial and and it's got moving parts so if if as a researcher i want to go and work with practitioners i do need their organization to be enabling them to do that if an organization truly wants to be um supportive and part of you know being a civic um civic institute and being part of their local community then they do need to in give their practitioners that flexibility to work with researchers as well as getting on with the day job but there's got to be some shifting of workloads and time you know because the thing is if you invest in people in 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 enabling them really excite them about their career in that they could work with researchers they could work with community partners and still deliver that job they're doing but how exciting would it be that it opens up the potential to work in many different ways with many different people and hence advance that particular service but we don't do that we're so fixed on uh whatever the the objective is or the target is or the benchmark is or the you know this continuous gatekeeping instead of thinking you know people are good people they're doing the job how can we help them develop further let's go and talk to them oh a researcher came along but they said no let's try and you know uh, ignite that again and see what we can do so we need those institutions to help the practitioners yeah, I agree. And I feel like the people are so focused on the distinct differences in personality between people who choose to do direct care and people who choose to do like a PhD in occupational therapy. Uh, but I feel like we should be focused on how we can use those differences to collaborate to make the field, I guess, more clear to people, especially um, in layman's terms, you know, my parents still don't know what I do or what I'm studying to this day. Um, but I feel like that collaboration and figuring out where we actually lie in society would really help us clarify what we do, how we help people and our power in, prevent in prevention care and for social justice care. Yeah, and it would help make us more visible and it might even get us exciting, it get us excited about rebranding ourselves in different, like I was saying in, in the UK, I think there's a great branding for the NHS, but it's not a great branding for social care. So, you know, it's about how can we do different things to increase our visibility, but to increase our uh, interconnectedness with the different parts of uh, work, institutions, local communities, education institutions. Um, and, and that's really important. But one of the things I think that really, really we need to tackle is that there are Black, Asian, people of colour, Indigenous people, occupational therapists who want to do research or in general in the in, in the health and social care practitioner community who want to do research but they are not given the opportunity and their uh, peers racialized as white seem to get those opportunities much more so we need to look at that as well there's a structural in inequality happening and we need to disrupt that by shining a lens on it but also say hey you know it's not about us accusing you here's the problem let's see how we can disrupt it and change it yes it's not to say you are so bad but it's to say hey come on this is happening this is what the data is showing let's change that because you know this is a great opportunity to equalize the opportunities for people and to show a change in the uh, demographic of who is getting the research who is doing the research you know and also to have those supports in place for people for their mental health because when you do research 
It is a lonely and hard work experience and it takes a toll, not only on your physical being, because I've chubbed up over my uh, PhD, but it does take a toll on your mental health. And we need to, if we're going to do things like education and research, we need to have those mental health supports in place. They have to be in place. Yeah, it's really important. I, I don't think my cohort understands how important it is to have the social support in occupational therapy. Um, I feel like I definitely feel it the hardest because it is really lonely, you know, to read all of these articles and you're just kind of wondering, why is it, I'm trying to say this in the best way possible, but what are a bunch of white people doing research in Africa for it? Like, what do they know about their culture? They're, you know, inadvertently westernizing what they think they need, you know? You can't just come in into a different country and throw money at them. It's not gonna do anything. I feel like people think diversifying occupational therapy means admitting more students of color, but not, you know, changing the curriculum with their um, ethics or advocacy classes. And I definitely experience a lot of that in my um, introductory classes, you know, the, the stuff about George Floyd, the stuff about Black Lives Matter. We don't talk about that. And I feel like it's something that should be talked about. And I think that's the first step in decolonizing occupational therapy. It's opening up topics into the curriculum that isn't westernized. So I do think support goes beyond admitting three people of color instead of one person of color. I think it goes into normalizing a diverse curriculum. You are, you are a person after my own heart. I am loving you. I am loving you. I'm sending you love and sending you love and peace because I can see your head is working hard in these topics thinking about them. Do, do you know, I, I say this quite a lot. I've been in the profession of education 18 years and probably 26 years altogether if I count clinical. But I have said this, I have found it really painful to come to the realization that as I have had a colonized occupational therapy education. I have accepted that and I have then recycled the inequality and delivered it to my students over decades and said, it's okay, this inequality is okay. You go out there and you just sit with the inequality. And I think a few years, well, maybe a, a, a year before, the tragedy of George, George Floyd, uh, I sort of started to think I've been given this opportunity with a module. And I know it's only just a module, but I could actually start challenging through this module, sort of the, the, the inequity and the inequality of the profession. Um, it didn't work too well, I must admit. <laughs> I think the students were like, what the? What is going on in this module? Um, but the next time I did it, I tell you this year, no, this year, the cohort have just embraced the challenge and, and have taken on the change in how they can talk about this, these topics and, and start to put a different lens on what is happening in occupational therapy and have the freedom to talk about it has changed how they are interacting with the other lecturers and, and the other lecturers modules. So it certainly benefits everyone to have a decolonizing lens to it. And here's a flip side. There are some courses that have a absolute diversity of students Yet, the paradox is they're still teaching colonized education. So that ain't going to work, is it? <laughs> so, you know, we have to take 
a multi-systems approach. It's not just about getting, as you said, a diverse group of students. It is about also changing the education that we're delivering. It is about changing the staff group as well. We can't have a majority um, staff group racialized as white. Then trying to understand what goes on in different cultures and then deliver that. Why are we expecting that? That's causing harm to them as well, because they're trying to deliver something that's not feeling authentic or genuine. And this whole helicopter research where you just fly in, you're not part of the culture, you go and do your research because that's going to help you and not the community, and then you leave. And then they're left feeling like, okay, we have just been used yet again, you know? It's just this, this kind of recycling of inequality has got to stop and got to stop and we've got to call it out, however uncomfortable it is. And we mustn't call it out as individuals. We must call it out as a collective, as a large collective of allies and peers of um, ethnicity and allies as well, because it's everybody's business to get this change. It's not just your business, Amber, or my business, it's everybody's business. We can't keep living the same trauma over and over again. And I certainly am not going to be part of it anymore. With all of this in mind, what is a piece of advice you can offer to a person who is about to enter the OT field? They're done with um, their clinical, uh, they finished their last field work, field work rotation. What are some ways that they can practice decolonized occupational therapy. If they haven't had a decolonizing education, you know, how are they going to <laughs> then go out and deliver a decolonized practice? You know, <laughs> they'll have to stop and relearn. They're going to have to stop and learn this all over again. And it might be that they're in this transitional phase, you know, where they're delivering their colonized education. And at the same time, they're reading, they're going to um, webinars, they're talking to the local communities, they are educating themselves to try and unlearn and disrupt some of that colonization that if they carry on with it, it's just going to recycle inequality. So if they are truly committed to this change, then they will take a pause, they will review, and they will reframe their practice through education, through communication, yes, through connectedness. And that's the way to do it and to keep talking to their peers, to other staff who are minoritized and, and, and to get understanding of what would be the best way to practice to provide the best impact, but also to chip away at that inequality as well. Wow, that's, yeah, <laughs> it's really hard to unlearn a lot of things. I feel like I received a very, very, very specific kind of education. Um, you know, I came, I went to a private school in throughout elementary school and high school and even college just through scholarships. So a lot of the education was very much like brushed over, especially with U.S. history. Um, but um I was kind of recently aware of how different my education was after the events of George Floyd, you know, and, it, and I was already around 22 when that happened. So it took me a long time to realize like, wow, all, this is all unfair. I am learning very different things. And it was really heartbreaking for me to realize that the last 22 years I was taught the wrong thing. You know, like I had no idea what the Black Lives Matter movement entailed until last year. I had no idea what it meant to distribute funds into different sources instead of, you know, policing 
which <laughs> is misinterpreted everywhere. But I just think um, it's really heartbreaking to, to think about. And I do kind of hope that a lot of occupational therapists can allow themselves to break down what they have learned and feel that same heartbrokenness, but come out of it a wiser person and a more open-minded person. I think it does hurt. It does hurt. And the important thing is, because I think I hurt, I hurt a lot when I was thinking about it and thinking about the the decades of students I've taught and, and taught this kind of colonized education. But the thing is, you can't sit in that. You can't sit in the pain because that is not action. You've got to go and do something, yeah? It doesn't matter however small it is, but it is disrupting you. It's disrupting your colonized education yes so you've got to take on the action and I know um to be quite honest I think you know when I speak to educators and and, and Twitter is a wonderful place for me because I've met so many students and educators from so many different countries and the the you know um South Africa um I've met so many people that I don't think I would have met. America, I mean, the the educators I've met, they're already working in uh, within this emancipatory perspective and viewpoint. The challenge they have is they're working in a colonized institution. Yes. And, and how do they break that institution to enable them to do the good work? And it, and so that that pain is real, but we've got to not sit in it and not to say, I feel the pain and I understand that now. That's just not enough. So what? That is, leaves you, leaves me with so what? Leaves those communities that are perpetrated against and disadvantaged with nothing. So we, what are we going to do about it? You know, how, how are we going to? Um, make change happen and it is inch by inch because this is like a generational shift you and I might be dead before justice happens but you and I have to be on that path of justice to create the change happening yes we've got to get on that road but I think you need leaders you need people with influence, the people with money, the people with influence. You can't get away that you have got to work with the majority um, peers uh, that are racialized as white because they are in the power and you have got to harness their power to work with you. And that's where active allyship comes into that. You know, there, there's no um, them and us. It's all of us. It's a we. We've got to do it together. Yes. and. I know, I mean, I know I am upsetting people left and right as I talk right now and as I do my things, you know. I know people are upset. You know, I've had friendships broken because I've decided I'm not going to take that joke anymore. I'm not going to let it sit. It's not happening anymore because that's just enabling and I want to stop it. But the thing is, I've shed people that are not willing to do the change work, but oh my goodness, have I collected a large number of people who do, and that's globally. Lots of people, not only in the UK, in America, in the continent of Africa, in the different countries of Africa. I've now got um, allies and peers from Brazil as well, you know, they are coming out from everywhere because everybody knows that it is harming humanity. It's not just harming a sub population, it's harming humanity. We are looking at ourselves and saying, What? We're still doing this? What? What? We've got technology advancements, we've got research advancements, yet we are still 
horrible to each other and we're still separating each other from opportunities just because of our ethnicity and skin color come on people come on that's all i can say i know i've i've lost i don't think i've lost family members but there are some that i have not talked to in almost a year because of everything that has just come into light with people finally realizing what is going on people find like even myself included i am finally seeing what is going on and i am actively trying to acknowledge it and i am absorbing as much as i can to really put that in perspective when i start practicing you know so i'm not just trying to fix a problem with things that i've learned from a textbook um, i want to take things more with personal context you know what are their experiences with society? Um, I think that's really important to start when you're practicing, whether you're a, a PT, an OT, or a general practitioner. It's um, getting their own context. Yeah, you know, the, we need more of amber. We need more ambers, not clones, but more ambers that want to that want to do the change action, you know, that, that want to engage with it and, and, and in a collegiate way, in a collaborative way, you know. There's this whole thing about polite persistence, but be persistent. You don't have to argue with people. Hey, you know, people will always have difference of opinions, but it's about whether they want to commit and resource the change action, especially in occupational therapy. We could be such a mover and shaker. We could be as a profession because we have that occupational science side to us. We have that justice side to us, you know. And then we understand people as these um, occupational beings, you know, we, we need to be doing to be able to thrive. And I just feel there, there's such a big opportunity here to be the leader and to put some of those other sciences by the side a little bit more. So I really, I just really appreciate this conversation. I wanted to ask you though about this, the PhD, no, is it the, the doctorate? The, right. The, I want yeah, to talk doctor. about that about a bit more because um, before you disappear, while you're still here, um, because in the UK, we have different routes to registration. Yeah. So the end point is the same registration to practice. So we've got apprenticeships of so people who are working and their workplace helps them get their qualification for registration through apprenticeship. We've got um, part-time and full-time bachelor's degrees uh, for occupational therapy. We've got the um, accelerated master's for occupational therapy, but also still uh, you can um, get a postgraduate diploma uh, and not a full master's and also get registration uh, to practice. So all those are different awards, but the end point is the same. And it's to enable opportunity for people with a diversity of needs to enter into the profession. And uh, so you, I kind of read up that in the, in the American uh, Occupational Therapy Association. Currently at the moment, you can still have a master's um, and a doctoral level, to enter for registration but you you were saying something like they're going to stop that and it's going to be fully doctor. right yeah that's actually a very <laughs> you know I actually picked a clinical doctor because I knew that they're phasing out master's programs and I have a lot of opinions about it but basically I think by 2027 in order to be you know to to be able to register as a new occupational therapist, you need to have a clinical doctorate to sit down and take the national boards exam. And I even think that they're trying to transition the 
occupational therapy assistant um, with a profession from an associate's degree or a two-year college degree into a bachelor's degree. But I think there's a lot of negative feedback on that. So I don't think that is happening anymore, but I'm pretty sure that the whole transition from a master's to a doctorate is happening in the next six, seven years. And why do you think that is? Why do you think they want to be so elitist, in my opinion? To I really, yeah, I do think it is elitist. Um, it, I mean, the fact that I was turned off by a master's degree because I knew that they were going to phase it out was, you know, elitist of me. But I was scared about my own, you know, well-being in the future as an OT. But I think it's... The reason behind it, I think it might just be the way that the U.S. has been moving with their professions. And you can see that with physical therapy, how it started out as a bachelor's degree. And then I think they're like, let's change it to a master's. And then recently, now it's only doctorates. And I think there's a lot of people fighting back against that movement in health professions. And... There is even a whole controversial thing with physician's assistants, which is a master's program. And they wanted, to they were thinking about changing it to a doctorate's program. But at that point, like a physician's assistant would just be like a medical doctor. <laughs> like, I'm not sure, but I really do think it's just an elitist thing in the U.S. Just trying to make it harder to get into these professions at least in That's my opinion. The point. That's it. You make it harder, you get more underrepresentation. Unless you are going to give support and money to those underrepresented, uh, underrepresented populations to get into that and to sustain finishing a doctorate. Because it's an award, I get it. But what has it got to do with registration do you know what I mean it I honestly do not think it has anything to do with registration I I truly do it's to do with status it really (laughs) does I truly do think it's a it's an elitist thing you know I am scared that you know when I graduate there is going to be a bit of like a whole gatekeeping thing between OTs with doctorate degrees and OTs that have a master's or bachelor's degree. And it's like the purpose of it isn't supposed to be so divided. It it shouldn't be a doctorate's degree, in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, I wonder, yes. I know it just it it's it was like when I heard it was like it's going to be the only way that you can get in America, you can get your um registration or, or you know to go and practice and I just thought god it's just instead of thinking about ways to engage and embrace the wider population it's more gatekeeping more shutting down and it's like have you not been hearing what's been going on in the world <laughs> we, no I don't I don't think they have no no thank you for talking to me about that because I just wanted to get your kind of impression on that and 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 see you know I just have a real visceral emotional reaction to it you know I do too that a lot of the programs that are on the OT portal system in the U.S. in fine print are like this is the last master's class offered we're now transitioning to a doctor program and I have no idea why they're doing that. From an outside, it just feels like there's some, you know, elitism, you know, gatekeeping, uh, some kind of uh, status game. You know? <laughs> it's just, and I just think over here, we, we lost our apprenticeship and now it's coming back again because, you know, we want more people in occupational therapy. And, you know, how can we enable that? to happen um it's yeah it's important it's important to keep the dialogue and to keep the scrutiny isn't it 
Thank you so much for talking with me and taking the time to do this with me. Even if it was just a class assignment, I gained so much out of this and I will definitely carry this with me for a very long time. Thank you very much, Amber. And keep in touch, watch our podcast and keep in touch. I will. I will keep following your tweets on Twitter. (laughs) 